So, so yeah, if you go to, if you type Julia MPC, and then you go to NLOpt control at the, uh, in the readme file, there's some basic instructions for um, installing the code. And um, currently, the package uses IPopt um, as the NLP solver. So that's an optimization tool that's open source that you can download. Um, let's see here, hopefully this works. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to go to Windows. <laughs> Hopefully that works. So is anybody installing it or um, having any issues installing it yet <laughs> while we're waiting? Uh, by show of hands, who, who knows what control is? Um, that's good. And then model predictive control. OK, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so if you, if you type Julia MPC in Google, um, then the um, repository should come up. The main repository is called NLOpt control. And NLOpt control. So if you, if you type Julia MPC, no space, um, I think it's, it's one of the first things that come up on Google. MPC, MPC, like model predictive control. This, uh... Oh, once I connect to the internet, I can grab some stuff. Hopefully my slides work on. The Windows side. Um, so I guess um, So um, who doesn't know what model predictive control is? Good. I could chat a little bit while I'm um, trying to get my slides working. <laughs> uh, so model predictive control is a method or um, a way to um, control things where you have some sort of model of, of your system and you're optimizing for the future, some future trajectory of um, what's called the plant. Uh, so the plant is generally referred to as your physical system um, and the controller um, is a model of that physical system and you can um, model the plant using the controller and look ahead into the future and say, What's, what's going to happen, say, 10 seconds into the future? Um, and you create some sort of a plan. Um, and then you execute part of that plan. So you're, you're finding the optimal control signals um, where, and you can then pass those control signals to your, um, to your plan. And you can continue to, hopefully this works, um, you can continue to do that. So you're solving it in sort of a receding time horizon. You're, you're optimizing for, you're predicting the future, what's going to happen. Um, and then you get this control signal and you pass a little bit of it to your, to your actual plant. 
and your plant moves a little bit and you continue to do this process. And that's basically model predictive control. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so I guess Windows, yeah, works great. So um, maybe it's some sort of uh, display issues with my computer. Um, so NLOP control is the package that um, some of you may have begun to download. And uh, it's something that I, I started um, working on um, really in, I guess, the December timeframe. So it's a fairly new package. Um, I come from a, a MATLAB background um, where I was using MATLAB and um, it was slow, so I switched to Julia. But uh, let me back up just a little bit and tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a, a PhD student at Michigan and I've been working on a lot of different autonomous vehicle projects. Some of them are listed here. Um, currently, I'm looking at high-speed ground vehicles. So um, we want to control a ground vehicle, um, basically a car. Um, and um, in my case, I'm, I'm supported by the Army, and uh, they want to control Humvees. Um, and we want to push these vehicles to the limit. So we don't want to just control it. We want to say, um, how can I get from A to B as quickly as possible um, while still obeying my vehicle dynamics so don't roll over um, and there's also obstacle avoidance, so don't hit obstacles uh, moving um, or static. And um, so, you're, so you're basically, you have some simple model and you're optimizing, uh, you're doing model predictive control, you're optimizing um, for a given uh, time horizon and then you're executing part of that onto the vehicle. And um, so I, I talked a little bit about this just now. So I, I did some also some powertrain design and um, Again, what I'm doing is autonomous vehicle controls, and I'm gonna um, show you this video, why Julia? Well, here's our algorithm running, um, and you can see we're, we're thinking about things like the vertical tire load. We wanna make sure that the vehicle gets very quickly from where it starts to the goal, um, and in this case, we're optimizing uh, both the speed and the steering of the vehicle. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem, and this was not solving in real time at all. Um, so I was charged to extend this work to moving obstacles. And um, for my last work, um, I would solve a look ahead horizon of about 10 seconds in best case scenario in about a minute and a half. Um, and then last summer, actually, I was here at Berkeley um, and I was introduced to Julia. And I started to look into Julia and I got really excited about it. Um, and I decided to try to make a solver package um, that could solve just a general optimal control problem, not just this problem. Yes? When you said it wasn't solving in real time, do you mean like in a real time simulation or was it actually running? No, no. Right now we're not, we're not running it on a vehicle, but even if we were to run it on a vehicle, um, when you take a minute and a half to solve a problem that you're supposed to, let's say your execution horizon is a half a second, so every half a second you want to pass new control signals to the vehicle, and it takes a minute and a half to get those control signals, you're gonna be you know, crashing into things by the time you finish the optimization. So you could like have a, like a virtual data feed that is equivalent to what you would get on a real vehicle? Um, yeah, so, so actually in this case, um, what we would do uh, is there's a higher fidelity model. There's a, um, there's a three degree freedom model for the model predictive controller. So that's the one that's looking ahead. And then there's a higher fidelity 14 degree freedom model that has hydraulic uh, brake dynamics and um, other more complicated um, things. And we consider that our plant model. So we optimize this lower fidelity model. We get the control signals, we pass it to the high fidelity model, and then we continue to do this. Um, so did that, did that clarify things? So we, we, we're modeling, we're modeling um, what we think would be the actual vehicle. Um, Right. Okay. Right, and and because it's not um, a real life, we we don't have to run it in real time. We can wait a minute and a half, or however long it takes sure. to solve the problem, then execute it a little bit on the simulated vehicle. Um, so. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. 
Right. Was, was the original plan to actually run MATLAB like in real time on the... No, so actually we, we worked on um, uh, porting it over to C, and even that wasn't fast enough. Um, so, so this, um, so it, this implementation is, is in Julia, um, has, uh, well, I don't wanna, um, it seems to be real time now. Um, so you're able to actually run the Julia simulation in real time with a, with a, uh, with a simulation like this then? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, so, so just the, the three degree freedom model, but the three degree freedom model is, is pretty complicated. Um, the, uh, you were considering longitudinal load transfer for vertical tire forces, uh, pure slip Pajeka tire model, which the equation is you know, pretty long. Um, so it's a, it's a really complicated um, problem that's actually non-convex um, because we have these obstacles um, that create uh, very non-convex regions in the optimization space. So I wasn't going to tell you that we solved it, but I guess that's... Yeah. <laughs> um, first, I, I wanted to talk about um, optimal control. In general, um, it seems like most of the audience understands control, um, so uh, that's good. But I'm still going to talk about a general optimal control problem, and for an example, I'm going to use the model that I just showed you, the MPC model, uh, where we have a, a three degree freedom uh, vehicle model. So um, a general optimal control problem um, is shown here, and um, some of the things that you wanna minimize are maybe the final time. So in our case, we wanna get to the goal as quickly as possible. Often in optimal control problems, you don't know the final time. So that's, that's actually a variable, which makes the problem more complicated. And then the second term, uh, these are integral con constraints, uh, or sorry, um, integral terms. So these terms, um, typically, um, you want to uh, reduce things like control effort. Um, so you don't want to steer the vehicle too much or constantly apply uh, throttle. Um, so you want smooth trajectories. And that, that term helps with those types of issues. And the next uh, constraint are, are dynamic constraints. And um, these constraints are, uh, for those of you who went to Chris's talk, uh, differential equation constraints, basically. We, we need to make sure that the dynamics of the system is um, satisfied. And uh, the next couple constraints we have, so in control problems, for those of you who don't know control, um, uh, the states um, are um, things like um, the, the vehicle position, where, where the vehicle is, and the control are things like for the vehicle problem, how do you steer it, or how much throttle do you apply? Um, so um, in Chris's talk, he talked about uh, differential equations in general, and the control aspect of the problem says, well, now that we have this model, how do we control it? So how do we move it around best? And, and that's really the extension that optimal control uh, adds to a basic differential equation. And the next uh, thing in an optimal control problem, sorry, are um, initial and terminal states. So, so when you start the optimization um, for the vehicle problem, you're gonna start at some um, x, y position, you're gonna start with some maybe yaw rate, um, all, all of the states um, start at some specific location and then you wanna to get to uh, some terminal state. So not necessarily is the entire vector, state vector constrained to get to some terminal state. So when you get to point B, um, you might only wanna constrain your X and Y. You don't care about the yaw angle of the vehicle, for instance. So um, the additional constraints uh, are shown here. So basically, um, it, it could be anything that you can think of. So for, for the previous problem, you saw the vehicle avoiding obstacles. So that kind of a constraint would fall into this um, category where um, you wanna make sure that the vehicle doesn't collide with obstacles and you can satisfy that kind of thing with these additional constraints. And you could see all the variables here. So you have some actual initial state, control vectors, um, initial time, goal information, 
um, and you could read the rest. Um, one thing I, I want to mention real quick um, is, so we're solving this problem, um, and you start to solve it, if you start to solve it when the vehicle is, say, um, here, at, at this point in space, um, and you finish when the vehicle is here. Well, you didn't really initialize your problem very well because you started the vehicle, or you started the optimization knowing that it was going to take some time to run the optimization. Um, so a better way to do it is actually to predict where the vehicle states will be um, when you're ready to execute the optimal control signals. So you can predict, you know, um, based off maybe the previous optimization, the vehicle is going to be here at some new point, and that's where I want to constrain my optimal control problem to actually start. So those types of things are important. Um, and uh, the next thing I want to talk about is a co the co Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm actually um, not familiar with with that. Um, I don't I don't know if. I mean, it, it depends on the plant. Like, there are some uh, chemical process plants where you might have like a pipe delay kind of thing that would be modeled that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it might be definitely something to look into um, because that's that's really like um, I actually started to do some. Um, uh, actual physical testing of these algorithms on a, um, a tele-operated vehicle where we had some physical steering wheel and that was one of the huge issues. I was like, well, wow, we don't know where the vehicle is going to be. We need to start the optimization at a good spot and that's, that's something that's just very important. Um, so I just wanted, that's why I mentioned that. Uh, so it's definitely like an ongoing uh, problem or something that I'm, I'm looking into, I'm very interested in. Um, so so again, uh, we're going to look at the vehicle model that we talked about, um, or that I showed you, and what does the cost function look like. So, um, so you don't have to look too, too far into all of the variables, um, just knowing kind of a general um, sense, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get to the goal quickly. Um, and once we get to the goal, we want to have some desired heading angle, so we don't want to be headed like back you know, we don't want to come around and then have the vehicle headed back um, 180 degrees from where it was heading. Um, and we want to reduce the vertical tire load. So we don't want it to operate too close to the limits of the vertical tire load. And we want to reduce control effort. Um, so again, we don't want to uh, be steering too frequently or applying throttle all the time. So now dynamic constraints. So these are the, the differential equations for the, the system. Um, and they, they, uh, they describe um, how the vehicle um, moves now um, dynamically. So the, the states are x, y position, uh, heading angle, longitudinal speed, lateral speed, yaw rate, steering angle, and uh, longitudinal acceleration. Now, uh, you might be wondering why we have the steering rate and the longitudinal jerk for control variables. Um, well. It turns out that if we include uh, these derivatives um, and we penalize them in the cost function, um, that we can have a smoother response for the steering rate and the acceleration. So th these uh, help us uh, get that smoother response because we can penalize how often um, uh, the steering, how quickly the steering rate changes, things like that. So, um, so now the next part of this optimal control problem is the, uh, the state and control limits. So first, the state limits. Um, so most of the state limits are just, uh, you have some constant upper and lower bound. You can't go beyond. Uh, but for the longitudinal acceleration, we have a, a slightly more complicated constraint where the acceleration depends on the speed. So um, based off studying our higher fidelity model, we were able to see um, the, basically um, how much we think that the vehicle can accelerate based off the speed and we develop some nonlinear constraint and um, we're able to easily add that using uh, jump. <laughs> so this is a jump extension. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned that yet, but um, this, this software is really predicated off jump. Um, so definitely credit to jump. <laughs> so now the control limits. Um, so you have, um, again, constant bounds, upper and lower bounds, and these are based off actuator limits. So 
um, you know, you can't drive an infinite um, steering rate on your steering wheel because your actuator uh, can't do that. So now, um, initial state constraints. Um, so that's where the vehicle starts. So um, if, uh, you know, you want to start the vehicle somewhere and um, like some X, Y position, you saw all the states. So that's a big vector um, and you can have some tolerance. So, so maybe you don't care to be um, within some um, very high precision of accuracy of your X position because you don't actually know exactly where that's going to be. So it's nice to have a little tolerance in that uh, for the optimization. It'll help it converge a lot faster. So based off of um, what makes sense, you can set these um, tolerances for each state individually. Now, uh, the final state constraint just for this problem is the only thing we really care about, this is a hard constraint, is that the vehicle is at some X, Y location within some given tolerance. So um, the next part of the problem is the obstacle avoidance constraint. So uh, we want to make sure that the vehicle doesn't collide with any obstacles. And um, to do this, what we do is we basically look at a trajectory, the entire X, Y trajectory with time, um, and make sure that uh, the, the, that x, y point is outside some ellipse. So this is an elliptical constraint. And basically, we're checking each point and making sure that each state in time is outside of the op each obstacle. Um, and we can do that with this kind of constraint. Notice there's a time there, so the obstacles can also be moving as well. Yes? Uh, no, there, it's an ellipse, so it's a, it's a, uh, a function. Yep. But once you, once you discretize the problem, um, then you, it's, it's more like points. Um, so, so like for instance, uh, for some of my earlier test cases, I would have like a very thin obstacle, like a line. And if um, it's, a, it's a discrete control problem, so at the end of the day, if you, if you have this line too thin, you can drive through an obstacle, and that's a feasible solution because the line is between two points. Um, so depending on how finely you discretize this thing, at the end of the day, yeah. So, um, so then back to the general optimal control problem. So how do we solve this problem? Um, well, <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of different methods to solving optimal control problems. Um, did that go back on? Thanks. Um, so, <laughs> lots of projector issues today. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of uh, issues for solving these types of control problems. Some of the, the earlier examples were um, dynamic programming, uh, Bellman back in the 50s, or even earlier than that, um, variational calculus. Um, and um, then there are <laughs> there are, it's nice to have this slide there, but is this thing uh, going to turn on? It's, it's heating up? Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a... Okay. So, yeah, this is what I was trying to describe. It's somewhat difficult to describe verbally, let alone with the, with the slide. So... Uh, so you have um, in optimal control, you have, uh, again, dynamic programming, and then you have um, indirect and, and direct methods. Um, and uh, the difference between these, these methods is, is that um, in indirect methods, you, you optimize and then you discretize the basic um, difference. And then with the direct methods, um, you discretize and then you optimize. Um, so. Um, there, there are, of course, lots of uh, pros and cons for all the, the different methods um, that I'm not going to really dive into too deeply. Um, but uh, for our case, we're using uh, direct methods uh, because they can easily incorporate uh, things like path constraints, which, which are important to us in this type of um, problem. And under the direct methods, you have uh, sequential methods and simultaneous methods. And uh, the difference between these two is that um, the sequential methods um, 
they optimize the, um, the state and then the control is, um, is some continuous variable. So you're, you're basically, you're, you're running an optimization and then you're checking if, if it's okay, essentially. Um, with the simultaneous method, you discretize both your control and your state into one big problem and you run the whole problem. You don't optimize it and then check it to see if it's okay. Um, so with these, so the, the sequential method, some of the um, uh, methods are like the shooting method. That's a, that's a standard sequential method. So now with simultaneous methods, uh, there, there are um, three different types of simultaneous methods. So like um, the direct co-location, um, Gaussian orthogonal quadrature and uh, HP quadrature. I'll talk about the direct or the simultaneous methods a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but one thing that's important when you're, when you're doing these simultaneous methods and you're formulating it as some nonlinear optimal control problem using standard solvers like IPOPT or Nitro is that you have a really good way to um, calculate your derivatives. That's, that's critical. Um, so um, in JUMP, one of the nice things is it uses reverse uh, sparse differentiation, which is um, on the order of n squared for computational com uh, complexity. And compared to forward automatic differentiation, you're looking at an order of n cubed. And other researchers have combined this HP quadrature with forward automatic differentiation, but they've never um, combined it with um, this reverse automatic differentiation, at least as far as I can tell. Um, so that's what we're doing in NLOP control. That's really the heart of NLOP control is combining this method. And I'm gonna talk about the HP quadrature method right now a little bit more in detail. So um, direct methods, um, so these are methods like um, all commonly like the, um, the Euler method or the midpoint method. You're making some local approximation of your function and um, as you increase the number of points, you can converge, but you might need a, a lot of points to converge. And then um, the Gaussian quadrature co-location method. Um, so instead of making some local approximation of your function, you make a global approximation of your function with a, a polynomial. And the order of the polynomial um, may have to increase um, to a large number in order to accurately represent your solution. And uh, what the, the HP quadrature co-location method does is it combines uh, these two ideas where you can have um, basically, it's, it's basically a multiple interval um, uh, quadrature method. So you have multiple intervals, you have multiple polynomials in the intervals. Instead of one big polynomial, you can have um, like 10 polynomials of order whatever you want, and these polynomials should be connected. So those, can, those are the constraints. Um, so uh, Professor Rao at the University of Florida did a, a lot of work um, developing these types of methods. And um, in this um, software, I try to implement um, that type of method. So um, now what we want to do is uh, talk a little bit more about the method and um, how, it, uh, how to uh, formulate it. So, so again, we need to apply Gaussian quadrature. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is uh, scale the, inter the, um, the integration interval from zero to TF um, from negative one to one. Um, so how can we do that? We can introduce this uh, change of variable, um, tau, and um, we, can, we can replace all of our T variables with this um, change of variable. So how does the optimal control problem look like when we uh, change the variable? Well, we replace all the Ts with taus, and then for the dynamic constraints, um, since we change the limits of integration, we have to multiply by this um, t minus t naught over, over two. Um, and then for the final, the initial time and the final time, those are just negative one and one instead of t naught and, and tf. So, so now that we've modified the optimal control problem, let's, let's take a look. So that was like a, a that's like a single um, um, interval pseudospectral method where you would just um, change it the limits from negative one to one, um, and you could have one polynomial in that interval, but when you have multiple polynomials, which is what the HP method is, um, things become a little bit more complicated, so we have to divide this range from negative one to one, 
into uh, multiple intervals. And you can see uh, these multiple polynomials here. Um, so these are the states, and we're approximating the states using um, these polynomials within the intervals. And we want to make sure that the, the um, states at the end are actually at the same point. Um, uh, previous re researchers had actually um, constrained those states to be at the same point, but programmatically you can make that the same variable, and that reduces, um, that removes a constraint, uh, makes the problem a little bit simpler. Um, so, um, so what we need to do is um, basically break up these, the interval from negative one to one into um, TK intervals, where TK is the number of intervals and uh, the constraint would be that all of these um, times are um, um, following in the, in the correct order. You don't want you know, one time being uh, before the other one. Um, so when you divide the thing up, uh, this is the kind of thing that you do. So, so, um, uh, so you could just do an even distribution. You could just uh, divide it up into uh, two things where you'd have negative one, zero, and one. So you'd have two intervals. Um, and uh, that's how you, you're, you're basically dividing that up. So then um, what does the optimal control problem look like now if we consider um, multiple intervals? Well, um, we have to add, we have to consider um, all of these variables in each interval. So it's basically just a, a stack of these problems um, that we're introducing. Um, so now uh, what we want to do is um, actually, since we have these dynamic constraints on our state, um, we actually need to approximate the state. And the way that we do that um, is using um, the, um, um, I'm sorry, Lagrange polynomials and, um, oh, yeah, so we actually, oh, I don't talk about this in this slide. So we use, um, so we need to approximate the, straight, the state and we need to do that because we need the derivative. Um, we don't actually need to approximate the control um, because we don't need the derivative of the control. And so the next couple slides are going to be uh, talking about how do we approximate the state. And um, so once we approximate the state and um, we have the control variable, we need to transcribe this into some big nonlinear programming problem. So the other part of this is these are continuous variables. So um, the state and the control. So we've been talking about some continuous problem. Um, eventually, we need to evaluate uh, this continuous problem at some point. And the points that we evaluate the problem are these taus. So we, we can evaluate it um, at our uh, times, the different times, um, like in this diagram. Um, see these points, those would be the different taus so that we would, would evaluate all of the uh, states and controls at um, for each interval. So then we end up with these uh, matrices that are uh, just stacks of numbers. And um, once we have that, we can um, use jump to formulate this nonlinear programming problem and solve using, again, standard solvers like IPOPT. So now, how do we approximate the state? So we, we do that using uh, Lagrange polynomials. And um, we use for the nodes to, to um, actually approximate the, the states at we use um, the Legendre Gauss Radu uh, co location points. So those are um, obtained using Faust, fast Gauss quadrature. So that's another package that NLOP control relies on. So it uses that package to calculate the nodes for um, the, this type of quadrature method. And that's where we're evaluating our states. And now that we have that, we have um, some approximation of our state. And what's nice about this is we can then take the derivatives of these Lagrange polynomials and we can uh, use that to approximate the actual derivatives of our state. So this is important for the dynamics. So now, um, once we have um, that done, we also need to consider that we have to evaluate the limits for our states and controls at all of the node points, so we end up with these matrices for the minimum and the maximum um, for the state variables, and these are again just discrete uh, variables that we're, um, or uh, matrices where we're, we're finding um, the, um, the values of at certain intervals in time. 
So now we have this modified optimal control problem that's discrete. Um, and um, now you can see here, these are all the, the discrete um, states and controls, and we can um, plug it into this equation and then eventually um, formulate a big NLP and easily solve using um, fast solvers. So now that um, we have a little bit better understanding of the meat of, of what NLOP control does, um, let's, let's take a quick look at um, sort of where it falls in. So it's, um, I guess I've already mentioned this, so it does the quadrature method and it combines this with a reverse automatic differentiation. So some of the things I talked some about, go ahead, Chris, yeah. So, so just in that the control is something that you don't know and that directly affects the differential equations, that's the, I think that's really the, the distinction between optimal control and differential equations. Um, so, so then, um, again, I, I, I just mentioned, I just wanna um, mention we have some model predictive control features and um, I have, uh, examples and I try to do some automatic visualization and we have uh, nonlinear time varying constraints. These were important for moving obstacles and um, we have several differential equation constraints. So I mentioned the HP quadrature method. We, I also have the midpoint, actually, sorry, this is, <laughs> I have the trapezoidal method and the Euler method. Um, so I can implement uh, new differential equation methods and you know maybe Chris can help me <laughs> in the future um, pull some of the um, solver power from, from his toolbox into um, uh, this kind of tool. So, um, so where does it fit in? Um, so I, I had a, a question about um, uh, optimal control and it's a nonlinear optimal control problem and the other nonlinear optimal uh, or nonlinear optimal control solver, solver, solver and the other one is switch time opt and um, that one doesn't use jump, but um, my package relies on jump, and um, it, it's a bit different than uh, the switch time optimal control. So um, I mentioned that um, you guys sort of squeezed it out of me that we were solving the problem in real time now, um, and this is an example of um, the, that actually being done. So, so what we're looking at here is uh, the, the vehicle, uh, the same, it's not as fancy as the other one, um, but I, I wanted to show some of the other, um, some of the states and how they're changing in time. Um, but basically you can see this is the vehicle and the purple is what you, you're predicting. That's the, the predictions of, of where you think um, or where you think the vehicle should best move. And then the green is where the plant has been. And um, you can see that these solutions are updating um, because when the vehicle moves, it's not gonna be exactly where it, it thought it was going to be perhaps, and um, you get different solutions. And also you're, you're solving a nonlinear non problem. You're, you could get stuck in local minimas and things like that. So um, you're not gonna be guaranteed to have the same solution, even if it was to, to just move it ahead a little bit. So um, you could see uh, the speed here of the vehicle and uh, the steering angle. It's, so these are pretty, this is pretty smooth. Um, and even the, um, the acceleration is pretty smooth because we have those, the derivatives of those in the thing and we're penalizing them so we can get smooth responses for these states. And uh, you can also see the, the tire force, so that's something that we're, we're considering. We wanna make sure that we keep that, that above this certain threshold um, so we don't roll the vehicle. So we're, again, we're looking at the Humvee. It's a large high center of gravity vehicle. Um, so the optimization time um, is really what we were excited about. Um, so the execution horizon is half a second, and uh, you can see that all these points are below that, so we're solving the problem quickly. Um, so here's a, a slightly modified problem, so now we're gonna do, um, try to follow this path and avoid obstacles, so it's you know, a different um, objective function, and, um, uh, but you can see that we're, we're also solving the problem very quickly, and um, we're trying to push the vehicle to, to its limits, so you can see it's uh, making sure that it doesn't hit um, this threshold on um, tire load. So um, now, hopefully this works. Um, 
I was going to have everybody go to the, um, the iJulia notebook, and um, I guess I could show uh, the thing here. Okay. So, um, so who is interested in um, solving some optimal control problems? Uh, Okay. Do you guys did you guys get it installed? Yeah, where's the notebook stuff? Um, so if you go to examples and NL opt control, it's in there. Is the notebook supposed to run in Julia five or six? Um, I actually just updated it an hour ago to run in both. <laughs> so they released six last night and I didn't realize that until recently but updated it and runs in both. Um, so, so yeah, installation instruction. So there's a few different packages. Um, you don't need these two packages. This is, um, these are optional. Um, vehicle models it has some of the vehicle models that I showed you and pretty plots is um, my attempt at, at making um, nice animations. And um, so either Nitro or IPOPT can be used. Um, by default, um, I, I have, IP opt working because most people don't have the money for Nitro. So, um, and you can use any uh, backend that you want. Um, and I switch between these all the time. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it's working on um, <laughs> this Windows machine, but GR usually um, works the most reliably. So, um, in order to run this, these examples, um, you just need NLOP control and pretty plots. And by default, um, I'm using GR as a backend to plot things. So you don't need this line. But if you would like to use, uh, make some pretty looking plots with LaTeX, you can un and you have all the packages installed, you can uncomment this line and um, it'll work fine. So, um, so now I, I want to talk about, um, or I want to just give you another um, example of an optimal control problem. So the Bercristochrone problem, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, so you have some particle um, sliding without friction um, along a track. And um, the idea is that you know where you start and you know you're constrained to stop some somewhere. So you have some initial and terminal constraint. And the idea is, what is that? What is that best path? Um, and um, in this example of the Bernoulli, I'm uh, sorry, Bercristochrome problem um, solved by Bernoulli, um, we have uh, three states, and um, x1, x2 are the x and y positions, and um, they are um, the amplitudes modulated um, by the the vertical uh, velocity, uh, which is x3, and um, that the control um, variable um, modulates the cosines and sines. So you can, you can make any path using this um, cosine sine with the, the amplitude and um, the angle in there. And uh, the boundary conditions are just going to be that at the initial time we have to start at zero, zero, zero. So x, y, zero, zero, and velocity, vertical velocity, zero. Um, and at the final time we want to be at um, two in the x and negative two in the y, and we don't care what the velocity is. So the, velo the final vertical velocity is free. And what we want to do is minimize time. So we want to get from here to here as quickly as possible and minimize time. So um, the first thing that we need to do is to um, formulate the differential equation. So um, so the differential equations are written in expressions. So you, you um, sorry, it's difficult to look uh, to see that. So the differential equations are formulated in an array of expressions. So um, who is familiar with an expression in Julia? I guess most people, yes. <laughs> I'm sure Chris helped me uh, deal with these issues. Um, so um, it's not evaluated and um, unless you put a little money sign in there and uh, this first element in this array is the first differential equation, and that basically says, 
um, x3, so that is the third state variable, and j um, is, is an index that basically says the entire x3 uh, state. Um, so j is there because sometimes you only care about the final state or the first state or um, uh, maybe some part of the state. So for, for this case, for most cases, uh, for the differential equation definition, you, you have the entire x3 uh, state in there and then time sign. Um, and all of the states are, are, for now, they just start at x1, x2 to xn and the controls are u1, u2 to un. So in, in the current implementation, uh, the way that you um, call uh, or, or define these states in this differential equation are using these x1s through xn's and u1s through un's. So the first element is, is just x3 uh, times this sine of, of uj, and the next element is um, the next term in the differential equation. Um, if you guys remember, it's just here. It's the negative x3 cosine of uh, u1. Can I have, yeah, can I have both there? And um, the final term is shown here. So you can see um, it's a pretty uh, simple definition of the differential equation. And um, you, uh, any, yeah, questions? So just to be clear, the, uh, those symbols, like the, the, the number of x's, the, the j in there, those things are kind of like built in. You can't like yeah, right, right. Yep, yep. So right now, yes. So, so right now, just use <coughs> x1 through xn. Um, for how many states you have and put the, the J in there to, to represent the entire um, X, um, that entire state. Yep. So um, another uh, thing is that we had boundary constraints, right? So we, we were told that the, the, um, the initial state um, had to be at um, 0, 0, 0, and um, that specified um, not yet, but th we're defining a variable that eventually we'll use. Um, we're just saying x naught equals zero, zero, zero. And notice it's not zero, 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 zero point zero, zero point zero, zero point zero. So these are all floats. And for right now, I, that's, all, that's how I have it implemented. I'm sure I can extend it to multiple types, but um, for now, just have um, the limits or the, the initial states and the final states be floats. And if they're free, you just put a NAN. So if you don't care, for instance, about the final um, vertical velocity for this problem, just put NAN for that element. Um, and that's what I talk about in this notice thing. And um, so now that we have the problem defined, we have the differential equations defined, um, we have um, the initial and the final state uh, constraints defined, we know that the number of states is three and the number of controls is one, we can, um, actually define, a, make a basic definition of this problem. And that's, that's invoked using this define function. So n is the um, object that holds all of the optimal control information and um, number of states and number of controls, as I mentioned, and uh, initial state. So uh, some of the other things that you might have in the optimal control problem. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yep. And x3 is the, the vertical? Vertical velocity, yes. Yep. Okay. And that's, so why doesn't the horizontal velocity just start at zero? Okay. Um, so that's not, that's not one of the states um, that doesn't affect um, this problem. Okay, just have, I've just seen this before, I think, where it just, you just set the initial velocity. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's not, that's not one of the states for the problem. You could make the model more complicated and add a, a horizontal velocity, um, uh, but that's not in this model. Okay. Um, so some of the things that you might have um, that this problem doesn't have are, are low, upper and lower bounds on your state variables. Um, so uh, those you could add with XL, XU, and CL, and CU, and these are um, constant upper and lower bounds on your states. Um, you can add uh, nonlinear ones, but that's not, um, you don't do that in this basic defined function, but in this basic defined function, you can add all of these 
and arrays, just like you added x0 and xf. So um, the next part of the problem is where we um, uh, do a little bit more work and we configure the problem. So um, given n, uh, we can define um, uh, a number of points. And um, NCK, so by default, we're using the pseudospectral method. Um, and if we say NCK um, equal is 100, and that's an array, um, that means that we have one uh, interval with 100 points in it. For the, so we're using basically a single interval pseudospectral method. If we wanted to add multiple intervals with different numbers of points, we could just put a comma, maybe 10, comma 20, whatever, whatever you want, however you want to define um, uh, these polynomials. And the next part that's, that's important is you have to tell this thing if final, the final time is a design variable. So in this case, the final time uh, is a design variable, and this is um, one of the keyword arguments that you need to pass this configure function. And um, uh, yeah, th these things are just um, explained there, like I just said. And now we can define the objective function. So uh, I don't um, uh, try to uh, rewrite jumps um, macro for defining an objective function. I use it directly. And uh, the way that you do that, um, for those of you who are familiar with jump, is this, this at nonlinear objective. And then n, again, that's, that's the object that stores the entire problem definition. Um, dot MDL, that's the jump model. So you're saying n, this problem, and you, you go in and you pull out the jump model, and you're specifying an objective on that. Um, and you want to minimize n.tf. So n.tf is the final time, and that's how you refer to that um, variable. So now um, you just call optimize, and it runs the problem and solves it. Um, so um, yeah, it's giving me some errors, but still giving me the plot. Um, so. Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, but um, these are the different states. So if you call, um, sorry about that. So if you call all plots and you pass it n, it automatically plots all of the states and the control variables in one huge plot. Um, and you could see that here sort of. Um, it's difficult to see with this. Um, but. Um, it's maybe a little bit easier to interpret this plot, though. Um, so we have, um, we can call just one state plot. And um, uh, what, what you can do is um, you pass it n, and you pass it 1. So 1 is the, the first, um, or the second argument in this function um, specifies the index. So we're, this is a model predictive control problem, potentially. Right now it's not but you are just passing it the first um, uh, element of the solution in n. Um, and then the second two arguments are the states. So we want to pass it the first state and the second state. And you can see um, that the, th these are the x and y positions. And uh, basically, uh, the particle um, comes down to this final point, um, negative 2, 2. And um, this is the, the path that it follows. So, um, so some of the things that, um, uh, yeah, so this is just talking about the, um, a little bit of documentation on that, that plot function that I just talked about. Um, so some of the things that are going to be interesting um, are obviously the data. So all of the data is uh, saved in n.r.dfs um, for the states and the control and the time. So you can see uh, this is an array um, of all of the states and basically the solution to the optimal control problem. And um, you, can, you can look at that and you could use that to make your own plots or um, do your own um, data analysis. So now um, I'm, I'm basically just talking here about 
um, how to, for those of you who aren't familiar with arrays and, and data frames, um, how to um, call just a little piece of that um, data. And um, yeah, anybody can come to me and ask me about specific syntax later, but that's just basic Julia. Um, so another, another thing that I'm saving is uh, n.r.dfs opt. And uh, important things in optimal con optim optimization problems in general, uh, how long did it take to solve? Um, what was the you know, objective value? And um, what's the status? And iteration number is actually um, something that I, I have for a potentially higher level algorithm. So often uh, model predictive control problems are nested and um, uh, it might be important to, to know um, what iteration number another algorithm is on for um, for your purpose. And yeah, these, these um, tables are just basically summarizing everything that I'm, I'm saying. And um, you can uh, quickly resolve the problem. And um, you know, one of the things that you might have noticed is that the, the optimization time uh, was uh, 5.9 seconds, which is quite a long time. Um, but since you since jump uses um, hot start, uh, you can resolve the problem um, very quickly, and you can see that the the time that it took to solve the problem is much smaller. So, so for instance, in in my in my case, um, when the vehicle first starts up, um, we just run the optimal control problem, and then um, after the initial run, we can solve much faster. Uh, even though things are changing, even though those obstacles are moving, you're getting new information. You can still solve these problems very very quickly. But the, the first time the thing starts up and runs, it takes a little bit of time. So here, here's another example. Um, this is a, a moon lander example, um, where basically you want to get um, down to the surface of the moon, um, and your control variable is some sort of thrust. Uh, so you start at some height. You want to get from 10 is the height down to um, uh, zero, so x1 of zero is 10, x1 of tf is zero, so you want to land on the moon, and um, your x2 is the velocity, and the initial velocity is a, a negative two, and the final velocity, you don't want to be smashing into the moon, so it's zero. You want to um, have a zero velocity when, you're, when you arrive there. And um, some control limits, so this, these are limits on, on the thrust, how much thrust can you apply. Um, and um, the optimization problem, um, you want to find the time that minimizes the, the integral of the control. So um, that's a, a basic definition. So how do we, um, how do we solve this? Well, again, uh, we have these uh, arrays of expressions, and we just write it down. We have x1j, u1j, and uh, minus, and this is negative 1.6. That's the g on the moon. So it's the moon lander problem. And uh, G isn't varying, it's just 10 meters. So, um, so some optional things that you can do. Um, so by default, I said it's X1 through Xn and U1 through Un, or however many controls and states, it might, N might not be the same. Um, what you can do, and for now, this is just for the plots and for the data that's stored in the data frames. Um, you can change uh, the names. Um, here, you just uh, basically have this array, and you have these different descriptions, and these are used for the plots, and you call this function. So um, it, it helps make the um, visualization a little bit cleaner. Um, um, so now, uh, the new thing about this problem is that now we have, previously we just had NTF in the, um, in the problem, so we just wanted to minimize final time, but now we have the integral of the control variable. And this um, makes the problem a little bit more challenging. So the integrate function um, is, is something that I made that helps you deal with that. So it, it integrates um, either control or state variable. So you have to specify whether it's a control or state variable. And um, there's several different methods. For now, it's, it's pretty easy to add new methods. But for now, I just have you can integrate just the basic definition of integration, like in our problem, we're just integrating from zero to tf of u. That's the default, just integrate it. And then squared is the integral of um, u squared. 
and then uh, you could do the cosine or the sine. These are, again, pretty easy to, to add, but I haven't needed any, anything else besides this for, for my examples and um, my cases. So, um, so now, uh, how do you call the integrate function? Well, you pass it n, um, which is the, the object for the control problem, and then um, you pass it n dot r dot u, um, and uh, what uh, the the what you're passing it is base is a jump variable, an array of jump variables. So um, all of the states and all the controls are stored in n dot r dot lowercase u or n dot r dot lowercase x, um, and uh, they're um, um, matrices. And um, the way that you um, can reference these jump variables is using this um, um, this um, uh, reference. So you can call, for instance, the entire, so this colon operator says grab the entire uh, first control variable. So that's, this is a reference to the, for the only control in this problem and the whole one. And um, in this case, um, we need to tell it that it's the control variable. Now, again, we're using the jump macro NL uh, objective, and we're saying that we want to minimize, um, and this is an expression that it passes to um, this macro, and then we can call optimize. Uh, so there's some additional plot settings. So the previous plots looked horrible, and you couldn't see anything because uh, they were so big. Uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks is not conducive um, to my traditional sizing um, defaults. Um, so you can uh, change plot settings. There's a bunch of plot settings that you can change and you can change them um, easily. Like in this case, we're changing the size um, of the figure and, and we're changing these MPC lines. Um, and yes, question? Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, just one dimensional and. X to its position, or no, X, X to its velocity. Yep, yep, exactly. Position, yep, yep, position. yep, and. J, and J is the integral of the thrust. J? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I thought you were talking about the index. So the track that minimizes time, but then, are you, so you're not minimizing J, that would be minimizing the total. You're minimizing J. Oh. And it, and it, it minimizes time, because when you, when you integrate, um, you, right, the time ends up coming down when you evaluate that integral because you're evaluating it at tf and uh, minus, you know, zero. Or evaluated at tf minus zero. And since that time is in there, um, you're, you're in fact minimizing time too. But u is the thrust. Yes, yeah, thrust. You, you got it? Oh, we can talk after if you want. Okay. So, so yeah. Um, and th these plots, actually, this plotting um, back end is um, PGF plots. So these are LaTeX plots. Um, so um, the solution to the problem um, uh, is as you can see here, um, you have um, some um, you know, initial velocity. You want to start here, some initial height. You're starting at this height. You want to get down to zero, right? You want to land on the moon. Um, and um, this is the control. So you could see the thrust. And um, initially, you know, it's not doing anything. So you're, you don't want to burn up fuel, right? So um, you're trying to minimize all of the uh, thrust, so it, it doesn't do anything for a little while, and then all of a sudden, boom, it uh, turns on the thrust, um, and you can see that it, it slows down um, because you don't want to smash into the moon, right? You want to have some uh, zero velocity once you actually land on the surface of the moon, right? So, um, so there's other, I, I mentioned a, a few other um, uh, dynamic constraint methods. So these are just the, the ways that we're, we're integrating the differential equation constraints. Um, so by default, again, it's this, this HP pseudospectral method. 
um, but uh, backward, backward Euler and uh, trapezoidal methods are also uh, implemented and uh, they might be better for your problem. So um, one of the things that uh, you can do, um, let's see, oh yeah, so this is just an example of uh, using the trapezoidal method. So, so in the configure, prob in the configure um, uh, function, uh, what you do is instead of ni, it's, it's called n, and you could say n is 200, that's the number of points um, here, and you say integration scheme, and this is a keyword that you can set to trapezoidal or backward Euler. Um, and again, final time is you have to set that. Um, so, so you can choose your solver. And um, yeah, so, so one of the things that's, you're building these models um, and a lot of times these are really complicated models and it just doesn't work, right? Uh, you, you run it and you're like, oh, it's not solving, the NLP didn't solve. Um, one of the first things that you can look is what are, your, what are the values of your constraints? So you're setting up some dual um, problem and you can look at uh, the dual um, values of, of your constraints. Um, so this software has um, a nice way of, of um, basically doing that for you, uh, but by default, um, I don't store, or I don't, I don't calculate these values, and I don't return them. So if you just look at, the, and where they're stored is n.r.dfs underscore con. So if you, if you look at that, it's empty. There's nothing there for the problem that we just looked at. Um, and if you look at n.s, so this is a setting, um, eval con, uh, false. So by default, I don't do this. Um, but you might want to do it, and you just set this thing as to true, and then you run your optimization, and when you look at it, um, you could see, again, it's, it's an array of these data frames because you might be solving the problem a bunch of times um, in this receding time horizon. Um, and um, you can see all of the values for uh, the dual and feasibility constraints and uh, for this problem, it was optimal and everything was fine. Um, but if you get an issue, um, which uh, you know, I had a lot of setting up my, my more complicated vehicle problem, um, you look at these constraints and, and uh, you could see, um, for instance, X naught. So this is the, the, where the vehicle had to start. This is where the vehicle had to stop. And this X1, X2, um, these are the constraints for uh, all of the dynamics. So if you have a high values here, and um, you can look at the maximum with this function, eval max dual infeasibility, um, then you can say, oh, maybe this constraint is degenerate. You know, maybe I've uh, constrained this thing twice for some reason by mistake, or um, it's just uh, not working out. I need to reformulate the problem. Uh, this is really a helpful feature um, that can help you sift through those modeling issues. Uh, so another thing that you can do um, that, that was really important for my problem especially is uh, looking at the tolerances. So again, you don't know exactly um, where the vehicle is going to be when you're ready to solve the optimization problem. Um, so your initial uh, state doesn't, you don't really, you know, it, it's not that huge of a deal. You don't need to be um, out to the, the um, eighth decimal point on that. Um, so what you do is, is you can set all of the tolerances for all of your states. Um, and uh, for this one, so I have um, XF tall, I set to two and um, 0.5. So um, the final tolerance on this thing, I now say, okay, it can vary up to two um, in this X direction, and um, for the velocity can vary up to 0.5. So you could see, instead of landing on the ground, you're two meters above the ground. So you could, you could have changed also the initial tolerance, so I'd change, I guess I just changed that a little bit to 0 0.05, 0 0.05. So you can, um, you can let it um, have some play in the solution, which is important for convergence time especially. Um, 
and maybe even feasibility. So um, at this point, I was uh, hoping to do, I don't know how I'm doing, I guess I have quite a bit of time. Um, for those of you who are interested, I was going to do a, a hands-on uh, thing where you guys could install the software um, and run uh, some problems and, and maybe uh, you know work through any issues that you have. Um, so um, for whoever is interested, I, I was going to solve this. Um, oh, looks like I didn't delete that. But I was going to solve uh, the Bryson Denon problem and a, a rocket problem, which comes from um, one of the jump examples. Um, so, um, so yeah, so for those of you who are interested um, and have things installed, um, if you want to try to write the the problem down and um, solve it. Um, at this point, I would like you to go ahead and try that. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Um, so, are there any other? I guess maybe there are any other questions. I don't. I know it doesn't seem like everybody's interested in um, the hands-on tutorial part. Um, so maybe. I'll answer any other questions that the audience might have um, before we get into that. Quick question. Mm -hmm. You've been developing this. Who else is using this right now? Um, some of my uh, lab members and then some of the other people at Michigan. Okay. Um, yeah. Are they similar projects to yours? Or uh, yeah, yep, right now. Pretty similar. Um, some different vehicle models and uh, different control problems, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, they're, they're vehicle problems. Um, but yeah, I tried to make it as general as possible. Uh, I have I have a bunch of different examples um, that you could see uh, if you if you look at the docs. But I solve I think like eight different examples, and and I just Google optimal control problems and you know, I could solve, I mean, I'm the guy that wrote it, but I can solve it in like a half an hour easy, like definitely no problem. Um, so this is a very powerful tool and um, anybody that's interested in um, implementing a model um, that they want to control, um, I have a, a package called vehicle models. It just has a few models right now and that has some more complicated um, problems where you have different parameters and um, expressions like tire force expressions and things like that. Um, and if anybody would like, I could help them um, implement their model into that package and um, see how it runs with, with the software. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess who could, could I have a show of hands of who was interested in the, the hands on thing? Chris? One, two, three, maybe four. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, are there any other uh, questions before we dive into that? No. Did it, uh, who, for those of you who are, who are interested in um, using it, did you, uh, were you able to get things installed? Yes? What, what are you using? Vehicle models failed to pre-compile. We had something else installed. Vehicle models is giving you some issues? Yeah, it says uh, pre-compile um, failed. Okay, you don't need vehicle models for these examples. Yeah, so they um, they brought out a new version of Julia that I found out a couple hours ago. I fixed I fixed NL opt control, but I didn't I didn't look at vehicle models yet. So a little bit, it'll work with vehicle models. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it works on um, 5.2, which I was which I'm still running on, but um, I didn't realize that they were getting ready to do that release. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I, I, have it, I, I have it now on this machine too, but I didn't realize until a bit ago. Um, so, um, Yep. Uh, in the differential equation, it has these terms gravity and gravity. Um, is, is there somewhere else in the example that where you define an outside function that you use in the differential equations? 
Um, I think I see, I think I know what you're saying. Um, so like, for instance, in, in, in this second problem, where you have a set of differential equations, and then you have these other terms, um, are, you, are you saying something like that? So if yeah. you have some, something that goes into the... Yeah, so like where, where am I uh, finding, how am I going to go ahead and find the drag of t and, and the other as a separate function of time? Um, um, oh, yep. Yep, so I was gonna, I was gonna get into that. Um, but yep, you just define it as an expression just like anything else um, because it might be really, you know, you might have to write these huge equations. Um, so it's nice to break things up. And it's, it, it actually, uh, with Julia's expressions, you can do that really quickly. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I'm sure you would get immediately, but maybe other people don't, um, is that when you have parameters, like here, we have this rocket. Um, I didn't talk about this yet, but it's the jump um, example with, for the rocket problem. You have a set of parameters, and these parameters um, are the parameters for this, these differential equations. Um, what you have to do is evaluate them immediately. So you have an expression that's unevaluated, but then you have the money sign, and that means that go ahead and evaluate um, the, the initial gravity. Uh, go ahead and evaluate the initial height um, so then you can plug this um, grav expression into uh, DE, and you would also want to go ahead and uh, throw an evaluate sign on grav. So you evaluate that expression, so you remove, you don't want a nested expression. So you basically are pasting it in to whatever DE you have. So you would put money sign, so if it, it goes into the second differential equation, um, and you would just put money sign graph. Um, so you can do that. So, um, so the Bryson Denon problem is, is just a, a double integrator problem. And uh, I, I don't show you the solution, but I show you the solution. <laughs> um, so you could see um, what you should get um, if you're able to. Um, go ahead and uh, run the problem. So, So I'm going to go ahead and open this up on my, I was just looking at that on GitHub. So yeah, barring my um, issues with <laughs> uh, not being able to run on my um, Ubuntu software, hopefully this works. Let's see what's happening. Oh, vehicle models. Um, oh. Oh, I thought I had a using vehicle models in the um,
So who is running on version 6? Yeah, most people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, actually it's pretty plots that is breaking. Um, So pretty plots is uh, just how you can quickly plot um, why all of the solutions. So it has um, so you can uncomment that you can use NLOP control without vehicle models or pretty plots, um, but you won't be able to see anything unless you um, plot the data the data in the data frames. Okay, yeah. So I have this vehicle. Uh, models plots. Um, so, uh, who is familiar with um, digging into uh, source code and fixing packages? <laughs> so, if you go into pretty plots, um, into the main macro, and you just get rid of, for now, all of these. <laughs> um, and you dirty up your, your repo a little bit, um, I think it should work. So I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't look at this and see um, uh, why it broke. But I, we don't need vehicle models for this example. Um, What, what did the what did the error say? Um, error is it error related to image four? Image what? Image four. I'm not I'm not sure. You also have to get rid of the comma on this um, last thing for the export since I got rid of some functions. I don't, I don't, th I think it, it just said that because I, um, because I had this comma. Yeah, I don't think I. I think it's okay. Oh wait, let's see. I think I just restart. Run all.
Oh, I guess I eventually have to fix this. And it's printing out a bunch of stuff now. <laughs> Okay, so it's working, good. So, um, so yeah, the, the thing that's breaking it is this vehicle models plot. I'm not sure why, but I just got rid of it. Um, so if you go into pretty plots, the, the main module file, and you uncomment the vehicle models plots and all of the, the functions that are associated with that plot, and you remove this comma, um, then it will work. Um, did, did you get it? Okay, so, so if you want to work the plots part, um, do you know how to dig into the... I'm not worried about it, Okay, okay. Yeah, so I, I will update it <laughs> so it's working um, after this um, workshop. Um, so... So yeah, these are all of the examples. So, um, yeah. Were you able to get it working, Chris? Uh, yeah, that would work. I'll have to pause it for a second. I was just about to ask you have references to see if we did it right. Did, if what? Do you have a reference oh. to check it anyways? Yes. Um, so, so for that problem, um, if, you, if you go to the documents, I think it disappeared on my... Um, so um, in the documents, if you click on latest, um, you can see the, the Bryson Denham plot, um, the solution to this problem here. Um, and um, the one that I don't have is the next example, because I, I didn't want anybody to cheat. But um, I can run that on my machine and show you what the lo that looks like. So, yeah, I tried the rocket one. Uh, it looked like I saw finished without updating the find out now. Okay. What? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it worked for me. Um, let me see. Let's see. Where's this? Oh. Do I have that? don't have that package in this on Windows. So So this is the, the solution <laughs> for those of you um, who want to cheat. But um, let's 
So you got you got it to run. Did you get um? Did you try the uh, the rocket problem? Yeah. I'm trying or I was. To get, I think I had something wrong. Okay. So if you go, if you wanted to cheat, you can check it in docs, and it's test two. Um, so if I, so um, one thing that uh, please be weary of right now is that. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and kill this, or not. I guess it doesn't do that in Windows. Um, is that it saves a results folder with all of the plots if you use um, plot all. Um, so you can cd, cd into uh, um, I'm used to using Ubuntu. Let's see. CD into C. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry about that. So let's see. So yeah, you can do it. Oh, I have all of the constants. So yeah. There's some things to fix with the new Julia. So yeah, plot the plots take a little bit of time to load up the first time that you run them. Um, and for some reason, right now, they're not displaying. Um, They're not popping up uh, with a um, a figure, um, but it stores them into a folder called results as well, and you can look at the um, the results. Um, and this is the rocket problem, the results for the rocket problem. Um, so we didn't talk about. Um, that problem, I guess we sort of skipped ahead. Um, but for that problem, uh, basically, you have a rocket where um, it's influenced by drag, and um, the um, gravity is actually changing. So as you uh, get further and further away from whatever planet or uh, mass that you're near, uh, the gravity changes. And you're given the expressions for how these functions change. Um, 
And then the different states are, are shown here. You have the height, the velocity, and the mass. So as you uh, operate your rocket, you're burning fuel, and um, that affects the dynamics of this thing. And the control is the thrust. So um, what, what you want to do is start at some given height, some given velocity, some given mass, and at the end of the day, um, you have a um, free height and velocity. You don't know where the thing's going to be at the end. You're not constrained, but you are constrained with the, the final mass. So you, you don't want to burn all, all your fuel up, right? Um, so the state limits are um, some initial height, velocity, and uh, mass, and you have uh, free um, states for, for both the height and the velocity at the end. Um, so those are the limits, the minimum and the maximum. Um, so you're, you're putting bounds, basically. Uh, you're saying that the height can't go below this value, um, the velocity can't go below this value, and for the entire time horizon, and the mass um, cannot go below this value. That's the final mass. Um, and for the, the top of the state constraints, um, for the position and the velocity, you don't, you don't know, you don't care, um, you're not constraining um, the upper limits, uh, but for the lower limit, um, you're constraining it to start, um, at, or sorry, for the upper limit, you're constraining the mass to be, at, at, the, at the beginning of the thing, the mass is maximal for uh, the rocket, and uh, the control limits, you have uh, limits on how much thrust you can apply again. And what, what we're trying to do is find uh, the track that minimizes, um, uh, or not the, the track, find the thrust that was, sorry, that was copied and pasted wrong, but we're, we're trying to find the thrust um, that minimize, or maximizes the rocket height. So we want to get the rocket as high as possible, and we have these somewhat complicated dynamics. You know, we have drag and uh, the mass of the rocket's changing, um, and um, the drag is um, some nonlinear function as well. So um, what you're given here is, is this set of parameters, and this problem is borrowed directly from jump um, examples, and um, you're given this set of parameters, and then you're given uh, a couple expressions. We talked a little bit about how these expressions um, can uh, go into the differential equation. So if you have complicated expressions that are uh, nested, you can easily do this. And you, uh, right, right here, I've given you what uh, gravity is. So if you, if you look back up here, um, the gravity is the initial g um, times the initial height over the x1 um, state and squared. And uh, that expression is written out here. And um, I was going to ask you guys to go ahead and uh, write out the drag uh, expression. So that's um, something that I guess Chris has successfully done. Oh, okay, the previous, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, Max, yeah. It couldn't find a good min for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't do anything. Um, and were you able to get the expression working? No, not yet. Um, okay. Did you say, I thought you mentioned, I heard you mention other docs somewhere other than the read the docs? Um, yes, so read the docs is actually something I probably just need to delete. Yeah, all Google wants to see That's, very bad. yeah. Um, so MPC docs is my new uh, documentation, and it, it's under Julia MPC. So, so for those of you um, online, I created Julia MPC. So it's a set of the different tools that I, I use, um, and it has MPC docs, NL opt control, um, pretty plots, and vehicle models. And it doesn't matter what package you can click on. You don't have to go into MPC docs, so you can go to NL opt control, and um, if you just look at the latest docs there. So right in the main um, page here, um, NL opt control, and um, take a look at the latest docs, and it has all of the, the different examples, um, and some more. So here's, here's like a, a robot arm problem. I haven't updated this yet with my new expression syntax for differential equations. Um, here's a bicycle model problem where I'm using the vehicle models package um, I'm not sure why this one's working on apparently version six, but it didn't work. <laughs> uh, so um, 
so yeah, I, I didn't put up the um, the rocket, the latest rocket problem um, that we're looking at, where the solution is here, um, but that'll be up there eventually. Um, but if you're if you wanted to copy and paste, or if you wanted to check out um, the answer, um, you can go into MPC Docs, and then go into Docs and then go into uh, the, the script test to. So that's just the script where I have the answer hidden. <laughs> um, so in docs, and if you look at uh, test two, the rocket problem solution is here. So if you had some trouble maybe um, with the expression uh, or the variables, you can uh, see maybe where you went wrong. Um, so basically, I've tried to make this software um, so that it's really as um, easy to define a problem as it is uh, when you look at a problem. So you see these problems and you know, we just want to write down the problem. That's basically what I want to do. I write down the problem and you know, do um, everything basically under the hood. Um, we talked some about what is under the hood. Um, and there's a, really a lot of power in, in this uh, tool. And um, I guess um, I think I have I did have a few more slides. Maybe I'll go through quickly now. Um, but yeah, there's there's a few different um, solvers, um, and these are some of the tools that that I'm using. I'm using um, Jump, of course. This is an extension for Jump, and uh, differential equations. I use that in the vehicle models to solve the differential equations. Um, very quickly, so when I'm doing model predictive control, I can predict with the differential equations um, where the vehicle is going to be, or simulate uh, the vehicle using the fast solvers and differential equations. And um, MathProj Base, of course, um, which Jump uses, and uh, Fast Gauss Quadrature and Data Frame. So these are some of the, the major packages that I'm, I'm using. Um, and, and documentation. Um, is where we just looked at. Um, you can just basically, it's right, right on the main readme file and you can follow links there. Uh, the tests are passing and I guess aren't passing with pretty plots right now in version six, um, but I'll fix that shortly. Um, and more tests will be added, but there's, a, there's a, several tests where I'm, I'm checking analytical solutions and I'm running all of the different solvers and um, making sure that in fact, the, the results that this package is giving us are correct. Um, benchmarking, I haven't done any benchmarking yet. There are, here are three uh, commercial MATLAB software tools um, that are similar to um, what I've implemented. So they're using the pseudospectral type methods um, to solve problems, but again, they're not using um, reverse automatic differentiation and they're not using Julia, right? <laughs> um, so n no formal benchmark is done, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. And um, so contributions are welcome. Um, I'd love to, um, you know, right now there's, there's a pretty uh, minimal set of users and uh, I'd love to expand that and uh, get some traction. So um, I would uh, be interested in any, anybody that, that wants uh, some help. I could try to help write down your expressions and uh, solve your problems or help you solve your problems. And um, of course, benchmarking and documentation helps, so he's welcome. Um, so, and new solver methods. Um, so I have some ideas for, for other solver methods, but nothing is, um, haven't done anything yet. So, um, so show of hands who is still um, working to get this thing running or looking at examples and Curious about maybe syntax or installation errors or anything like that. Where is? Hmm. Must be somewhere. I'm having trouble finding. We got too many things open here.
Um, any any suggestions, <laughs> uh, Chris or Tony, the couple of Julia experts that I know of in the room? Besides, of course, fixing the <laughs> latest one. <laughs> get it registered. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And get it registered. Get Tony to look through this and for the. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I had I had some trouble with that, but eventually got it working. <laughs> do you think that you can do that as a macro instead? Uh, yeah, I, I had I had macros, um, but eventually I I just um, did it as an expression, um, and it and it worked, it worked fine. Um, but yeah, I had. Um, do you think that it would be um, more powerful? I guess I could try to leverage. Okay. Uh, a macro that you just kind of write that code and it makes a compression array. Right. I think you have to be flexible in terms of like what you name your state control variable. Right. 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 Like you can't have it like command. It's like a lot yeah, of yeah. the advantage of Java is you can go to formulate your variables and your constraints in mm -hmm. whatever notation you want per problem. Right. Right. Um, so you can say like velocity and yeah, position yeah. and not have to worry about like indexing and numbering and assembling right. them into a single vector of x right. element one, element mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. I guess one of the one of the complications is with that, or maybe you, you can weigh in on it. But when you're doing a control problem, like there's a big difference between the controls and the states. So um, having a distinction there, um, I guess I guess I would probably need some additional functionality to to say okay, this these are my states, these are my controls. Well, uh, yeah, you could you could even in terms of the, you know, the jump extension, right? So mm -hmm. you could Right. So you could say at state variable, at control variable, mm -hmm. the user would still be able to name them whatever they okay. want. Okay. But when they declare them, yeah. they say state variable, okay. whatever they name. That sounds good. Control variable, mm -hmm. whatever they want. Yeah, that sounds and good. I think that one way, one way that you can implement it pretty easily is if you take a look at parameterized functions that mm -hmm. we have, right? Yeah. If Oh. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think it would be nice to have it. Um, it at least look pretty. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, Yeah, so um, if anybody has a, a, a date or anything tonight, they're, they're free to leave. Um, I, uh, I think there's about 10 minutes left, um, but I'll, I'll be here for the week, and um, I'd love to talk to any, any of you. Um, anybody else has any uh, questions or um, advice or anything, I'd be open to it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so question. Yes. Uh, The simultaneous method. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 are you asking me to compare um, like the? Yeah, like what's the performance difference, or what kind of problems does that like? So, 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 yeah. So, like, oh, um, compared to multiple shooting. Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess in in terms of multiple shooting. Um, uh, it, it can be difficult sometimes to incorporate the kinds of constraints that we want to incorporate. 
Um, but in terms of like, um, I, I guess performance wise, um, the only benchmarking that I've done is between like the Euler method and the midpoint method or the trapezoidal method and, and the HP methods. And actually the, the Euler or the simple trapezoidal method that are, that's in the examples works better for some examples. Um, Yeah. So actually, and also like I've, I've, I hadn't implemented in, in this package yet, but one of the things that I was thinking about, so right now if, t if time is a design variable and you have a hundred points with the Euler method, I just divide it evenly, but you can make those DTs variables too. And that, that offers, um, that makes the problem solve for really complicated problems when it wasn't solving before. Um, so, so like my vehicle problem wasn't solving, and I was like, oh, what if I make these time variables vary or time steps variable, and that would solve the problem. Um, so, so even like like some of the simple examples, the Euler trapezoidal method, th those work better than faster than the pseudospectral method. But the pseudospectral method works for really complicated problems, um, from my experience, better than the other methods. So you couldn't, it just doesn't doesn't solve if you try to use. Um, Euler or trapezoidal in the in the traditional sense on my problem, anyways. Um, so I think when your functions are changing very quickly, um, the pseudospectral method can offer um, more flexibility in, in terms of the the solutions it can approximate. That's mostly because you're need, going to need to use a, a higher order SIF solver, though. Like what if you use what if you use like right out stepping, except not as the co-location method, but as just like a you know just the implicit run of code method? Um, yeah, I'm not. I haven't. Yeah. So I haven't, I only have three, but I'd definitely be interested in checking out and benchmarking all of them. Um, I guess one question I have for you, for you guys is like in terms of benchmarking. Um, so when I start the, start the thing up and run it, right, the first thing takes a long time to run. So is that your benchmark? Oh, no, because that's compiling. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Right. You're probably also warm starting. You're doing the receiving horizon and have most of the solution from the previous step. Right. And but if you're, you're, I guess if you're just, but if you're just solving it once, right, just to try to get like a benchmark, like if I was trying to benchmark the three methods that I have um, uh, with, you know, some number of points for each, um, uh, I guess would it be the second, I would run it once and then run it again and look at the second time for each one or? Is that a? Or you know, I mean, there's there's more rigorous ways of doing it. The benchmark tools package will like run your function a certain number of times until it's collected enough data to declare you know, to do some certain sort of statistics. So it'll run really really short functions more times okay. to get a better like confidence interval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. At least if you're solving the same problem as many. Yeah. If, if you're solving a sequence yeah. of related problems, yeah. then from a controls perspective, you might actually care more about your worst case. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the yeah. right. Yeah, but if it's not stochastic and stuff, then yeah, you run it a hundred times and take the minimum time. That's how you know. Given that if, if there was no other memory flashing or anything, that's like the, your fastest. Thing okay. I guess I was just thinking it was kind of cheating, you know, warm starting it. Well, it's like, here's the solution. How long? Fine. Yeah. You can start from the exact solution. Right, right. But you solve like a modified problem. Mm hmm. Like, yeah. Shift that by once. Do the close, do it like a simulation of a closed loop. Okay. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that a good way to justify it is that you only care about timing if it takes sufficiently long enough time, right? So you either you either care about timing when the problem takes so long the benchmark uh, or the compilation actually doesn't matter, or you care about the time when it's a really short problem but you run it repeatedly, right? right? So in either of those cases, but the amount of time for compilation doesn't matter. So if you really want to get the, the what does it look what would how how is this looking on hard problems? You don't want to have a compilation in there. Right. And right. if you're comparing against especially MATLAB tools for a lot of these. Uh, yeah. 
Right. They're at a serious disadvantage because if they're if the user of those tools is specifying their problem, their dynamics, and their constraints and objective function in MATLAB functions, in MATLAB code, then their user defined problem da data is going to evaluate those slowly. So, like when you solve the actual problem, you see the IP ops uh, yep. timing. Yep. So it, it splits up to the evaluation. The linear algebra, the part that the optimization solver spent, mm -hmm. and then the, the function of value. Function. Yep. So, the functions time is where using Julia and JIT compiling your user input okay. on specific functions is going to give you a huge benefit. Oh, yeah. So the MATLAB base will get Oh, yeah. And actually, yeah, one, one other funny thing to mention. I, I saw that. <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, that different methods, seem, you know, like Euler and Capital, mm -hmm. seem to be better, doing better maybe than the literature might even suggest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wrote a bunch about this on the Stack Overflow the other day, that uh, the reason why it, you have to change which parameters you're thinking work in different cases when you go to something like Julia or even Fortran, because uh, the balance between how much of a, a function it all costs and like the base, uh, baseline uh, cost of the actual integration is, uh, the, the balance between them oh. is, is really what affects the choice of the integrator. So I, I think the biggest example is that uh, ODE 15S is the is a PDF method. So everyone tends to think that PDF methods are the method that you should use for set equations. But in reality, the reason why it's good in MATLAB is because it minimizes the number of function calls, even though it maximizes the amount of other stuff you have to do in the in integration. Mm -hmm. But that stuff is all written in Fortran, so it ends up being the best in MATLAB. Right? But then if you do go to the in uh, in Julia, you'll see that using Sundial as a CBOD PDF doesn't work as well as Rado, even though Rado has more function calls than Sundial. But that's because Julia functions are optimized. Mm -hmm. So yeah. The fact that you're saying that you know it doesn't line up correct directly with the literature, yeah, yeah it, it's really because a lot of the literature it's using an unoptimized function call instead of an optimized yeah. integration method, and so then it's seeing oh if I minimize the amount of function calls I make, then my method will be better. So mm -hmm. okay, it's a quirk of history. I that's think. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's definitely interesting stuff. Do so, can I show it? Yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, here's your thing yeah. back. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Oh, no problem at all. Thanks for your yeah, advice. We need, to, <laughs> we need to collaborate. I really want to see. Yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. I, I mean, I'd I'd love to throw in some more uh, methods. Well, I mean, if we can get it to just work in general, then they'll just. Oh, yeah. Um, this these, this is my documentation, so all all of it's on um, on this page, um, except it's not for in the examples um, no, it's in it's in tutorials. So oh, okay. tutorial. Um, did you? Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was going to go try to find that web page. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I was trying to fill in. Yeah. So if you just if you just click on the docs and then the latest, like under NLOP control, docs okay. so, latest. So you use the. Um, Dollar sign for any constant. Um, yep, yep. So, so let's let's look at it up here. I guess I'm still I'll being graphic, recorded. The, the graphic, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm just pulling it up for anybody on. I guess we're still. I don't know. If they're gonna cut this video, but yeah. So you wanna so. So so basically. No, basically says evaluate it right now. Yeah, like and then it sticks that. So the, the expression is unevaluated when you, yeah, okay. So, I mean, isn't it just equal, like, let's say it's like G, dollar G, and G is three. Mm -hmm. It's just as if you had written three in Exactly, it, it exactly. Sticks. Yeah, so, yeah, so like if you pull up, yeah, so if you pull up Julia and, used about so T is, T is four and then, E equals x dollar sign t. Um, and then you evaluate this. Yeah, no, I was. Um, oh. Wait, the x two is not defined either. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I know you did. 
Yeah, yeah. so w when you form the array of expressions mm -hmm. that defines the differential equation, mm -hmm. you just stick these like x2, yes. j, and but like they're not defined anywhere before that. Right, right, right. And then they don't seem to be referred to so after. It's, so it's passed in, um, it's passed into define. And then in define, I use them. I'm just trying to, sorry. What a, what a day with the computer. <laughs> I ran into like maximal issues. Um, okay, so here's, here's an example. Mm -hmm. so, so like U1 is just, that's the first time it shows up. Yep, yep, right so it's, it, you, can, you can write it there because um, it's, it's not evaluated in here. Um, and or then how is it in define? I pass it into define. So DE equals this. Yeah. And then so that's all an expression. And then I pass DE, which is the definition of your dynamic constraints, into uh, define. So that's the first thing you have to pass. So this is the basic definition of the differential equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, DE is the set of differential equations. Wait, so they're, because like all these dynamic constraints, they are these values and then they're... They're being, I think they're being evaluated. Well, so y you have the number of states, which is basically the number of, I, the number yeah. of separate differential yeah. equations. Yeah, so you could probably get, I could probably but get like rid of that, but it's used for a little bit of error sure. checking. And U1 um, is not one of those. I mean, U1 is what's being solved. Right, so that's the, con that's the number of control variables. Um, yeah, so. no, non controls is one. Wait, so, but this isn't coded so that U1 is always, is that the keyword for the thing that you're solving for? So, um, so no, so, so in this, in this um, it, so there's a few different definitions. One is the, f the first definition here is where um, you're defining your differential equations, you use, you know, like I said, X1 through Xn, and then U1 through Um, oh, that so might be different. U is a special. U is a special thing. Okay, that's what so I understand. So U is the control.